Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Uh, this is lockdowns, food security, and the role of external supports. We have five exciting presentations, hopefully a very lively Q&A, but also very little time. So therefore, uh, we go to Al Muxid Akim, Akim, who will present his work on the role of remittances in Nigeria. Thank you for having me. And um, my name is Al Muxid Akim, and I'm happy to be here today to present our paper uh, titled Do Remittances Unexpectedly Ensure Against COVID-19 Employment Shock? on food and security. So this is a joint work with the uh, firma IVOG and uh, Jeffrey Couton. Um, put it in another way, the, the basic question that we are trying to address in this paper is to look at whether remittances can ensure households during this co current COVID-19 shock. The question we are raising here uh, is related to a large body of literature looking at um, the insurance role of remittances in this of, of shock. Um, there are many studies uh, providing evidence of uh, this insurance role of remittances. Uh, most of them show that remittances can ensure households by allowing them to, to smooth their consumption during shocks, like idiosyncratic shocks, like death, or covariate shock, uh, such as um, uh, precipitation rate or uh, temperature. Uh, temperature uh, shock. So in this uh, literature, what is interesting is um, there are two underlying mechanisms that are highlighted. Uh, and one of these mechanisms uh, is what we hear, ex post mechanism. This is a mechanism that operates before, uh, no, during or when the shock happened. Um, basically, uh, when, for example, when the household experience a shock, the household may receive remittances that may help to, to, to cope uh, the shock. But uh, in this particular context of COVID-19, um, this mechanism is unlikely to happen because the COVID-19 affect also the, the, the migrants in the destination country. So um, the, the, the remittances is likely to decrease and then uh, we are not expected this mechanism to operate. This ex post mechanism can be opposed uh, uh, as ex ante mechanism. Uh, this ex ante mechanism is a mechanism that, that may operate before the shock happened. If you consider the, the particular context of COVID-19, for example, um, the, the remittances that uh, the household may receive remittances, uh, may receive remittances before the, the, the COVID-19 shock, like the previous year, one year before. And in that case, for example, the, the household may use part of these remittances to invest in productive activities or uh, to, to access financial services such as savings and credits. So this is the, 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 this mechanism, the mechanism that we are trying to, to look at in, the, in this paper. So now let's jump to how we do that. Um, so basically, we, we use uh, six webs of four banks household surveys that include two webs before the COVID-19 and four webs during the COVID-19. And then this, study, this data allow us to, to implement a difference in difference strategy. So, and the, the main thing this we found is that um, if you look at this graph, first that uh, following the shock, um, and we, we look, our, our outcome of interest here is food insecurity. And during the, sh after the shock, we see that there is a significant increase uh, of, in food insecurity. And what is, interesting, what is interesting to note is that uh, this uh, increase in food insecurity persists over, over time. And we found that uh, the remittances can mitigate uh, this adverse uh, shock on food insecurity. But it is interesting to note that this mitigating effect operates only at the early stage of, of the shock. Here, you can see here that the mitigating effect is significant only when the shock happened at zero, at time zero and at time one. But from time two, it becomes uh, insignificant. 
So the question is um, about, um, because earlier we talked about the, the ex ante mechanism, and in this paper we propose a formal way to, to test this, this ex ante mechanism by, by looking at how, um, by looking at whether uh, access capital uh, can amplify the, the mitigating effect of remittances. And in this table, you can see that um, households that uh, have access to capital have higher mitigation effect uh, of remittances than those who don't have access. So quickly, uh, we, draw from, we draw from these findings two policy uh, implications. Uh, the first one is that um, remittances are an important private element of social protection that worth considering, uh, especially in this context of COVID-19, where uh, government around the world um, are trying to, to revisit and to rethink the social protection strategies. So it makes sense to include measures that, that channel remittances toward increasing household capital. And um, a second policy implication is that uh, the, rem the remittance provided protection uh, that we found here has to be considered as complementary of existing social protection systems because we saw that it is effective only at short run. Over the time, uh, it is not, it is not uh, effective. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. It was very interesting, and also thank you for keeping time. Um, I just want to remind everyone that there is a Q&A tab. Uh, you can use that to ask questions and we'll have a Q&A session after the, all the presentations. And if you want, we can also invite you uh, to the stage uh, to ask your, ask your question using the video. So next up is, is Gibran Tafere, who is going to present on, on the role of safety nets uh, during the pandemic in Ethiopia. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending my talk. So the title of my presentation is COVID-19 and food security in Ethiopia, two social protection programs. This is joint work with Kavrom Abai, Kush Prahana, and John Hodman. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has tested food security and social protection systems, and its impact has been unprecedented. According to a recent World Bank report, uh, between 110 and 150 million people are projected to fall into extreme poverty by 2020. And the World for Program uh, has similar alarming projections. It's estimated that the number of people facing food acute food insecurity is, is likely uh, to double due to COVID-19. Under these circumstances, social protection programs can play an important role in reducing food insecurity and protecting against us. Uh, in fact, since the outbreak of the pandemic, more than 200 countries have implemented some form of social protection measure. However, we know little about the effectiveness of these programs. That's where our uh, paper comes in. So we ask two simple questions. One, what's the impact of COVID-19 on our social food, uh, security? Two, are social protection programs effective mitigating these impacts? To answer these questions, we focus on uh, Ethiopia's flagship social protection program called the Productive Safety Net Program. From now on, uh, I refer to it as just PSNP. It's a large uh, social protection program with approximately 8 million beneficiaries. It is targeted geographically at uh, districts with chronic food insecurity and within these districts at households who are food insecure and lack assets and have limited alternative source of income. To, uh, for, for this study, we used two rounds of data. The first round was conducted in August 2019 in 88 Waradas, where the nutrition sensitive component of PSMT was supposed to operate. Uh, we conducted follow up in June 2020, and we, we managed to cover approximately 60 percent of our regional households. At the baseline survey, the August 2019 was face-to-face, -face, whereas the follow-up survey was phone survey. As a result, we were only able to reach households who had access to telephone. And this would have implication to our estimates, and I'll talk about them uh, in a bit. 
So to our identification strategy is simple. We use standard difference in difference strategy where we compare food security outcomes of PSNP beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries before and after COVID-19. As I mentioned earlier, because our follow-up survey was from survey and we were only able to, uh, to reach households who, with access to telephone, our sample is by design uh, a selected sample. This would introduce bias in our estimates unless we address it. So to deal with this problem, we construct sampling weights which we use to adjust our estimates. So going to our results, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic increased the likelihood of food insecurity by 12 percentage points for non-beneficiaries, but participation in PSNP reduces the likelihood of food insecurity by nine percentage points. That is, PSNP beneficiaries are nine percentage points less likely to be food insecure. So in terms of uh, the raw measure of food gap, which is the number of months in which a household had difficulties to satisfy its food needs in the last 12 months has gone up by approximately half a month for non-beneficiaries, uh, whereas this number is less by 0.3 months for uh, SNP beneficiaries. So this, this result suggests that PSNP plays, uh, the participation in PSNP plays an important protective role. So in terms of heterogeneity, we find that the effects of PSNP, the protective role of PSNP is higher in poor areas, for poor households in households who live in remote areas. To conclude, we find that food security uh, deteriorated in the aftermath of uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. The Ethiopia's productive safety net program mitigated the impacts of the pandemic on food security. And we also find the protective rate of uh, PSNP is higher for poorer households and households who live in remote areas. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kibram. Um, Next, we have Saifaras, uh, who will be presenting on the impacts of the pandemic on Rohingya refugees in, in Bangladesh. Hello, I am Saifaras. I am currently working as a research fellow in James B. Grant School of Public Health of Brent University. Today, I'm going to present a paper named Impact of COVID-19 on household level income and food security on FDMF that is forcible displaced Myanmar nationals and its adjacent host community in Bangladesh. As we already know that, many of us know that FDMF are the mostly majority ethnic group who lived in Myanmar in centuries. They have faced, they have faced persecution for decades. The largest influx happened in August 2017 when almost 750,000 FDMF fled in Bangladesh. Now, this large community is currently living in Bangladesh, who are largely dependent on humanitarian aid. This FDM community is surrounded by a minority of less than half a million of Bangladeshi who are residing in nearby villages. They are known as host community. One of the poorest population groups are these host community, with a poverty rate less than 32%. Since the arrival of FDM, separate episodes of tension has been raised, including different kinds of health risks, competitive labor market, rise of living expense, and etc. Next comes a new crisis, COVID-19. And after the lockdown was initiated, both the FDM and the host community faced massive challenges in their lives. So the objective of this study is to assess the impacts of COVID-19 on households' income, food security, and to identify coping mechanism among most vulnerable groups in both two communities. We followed a sequential exploratory mixed method study design using both qualitative and quantitative techniques. For qualitative, we conducted 59 qualitative assessments, including IDIs, FGDs, and KIS. And for quantitative, we conducted 2,032 interviews. For both method, the target population was most vulnerable group. Who are these most vulnerable group? After several 
discussion with uh, different kinds of uh, stakeholders and uh, literature review, reviewing literature review found pregnant and lactating mothers, adolescent people with disabilities, elder people, single female headed household head without income or low income are the most vulnerable group in these two communities. And we found males were mostly the key bread earners in these two communities who are the informal job earners. Females were the mostly engaged in managing household chores. Over half of the FDM and adolescents were married. Around 19% FDM and adolescents reported that they had never gone to school. And also 16% of host community reported that they have dropped from their school. We also found that single female headed households are much higher in FDM and camps than the host community. That is the uh, almost 25%. To understand about the COVID-19 impact on household income, we asked the respondents about their job and household income status during pre-pandemic and pandemic period. And we found 54% FDM and respondents reported no change in their income because members of FDM and never had a regular job before the pandemic. In the contrary, almost 70% of households of host community reported a decrease in their income because they are mostly informal workers. They had a small business, which was highly affected by the, affected by the COVID-19. As a coping strategies, FDMN and host community uh, host survey, host surveyed households are mostly mentioned about their reducing their expenditure. They also reported about taking loans from different sources to manage their household expenses. In terms of relief, only 45% of women reported receiving food, which was not sufficient to meet their needs. In case of food security, almost 65% FDM and households reported running out of food due to lack of money in the past nine months of data collection. Almost half of the surveyed households mentioned that they could manage only rice on an average one to three times in a month. The picture is almost same in the host community. The qualitative assessment also found that the families and persons who solely depend on ration are suffered most. As a coping in strategies of food shortage, most of the respondents reported about borrowing food, eating less. Only 9% FDM and households can stock food for the crisis period. And it is also reported by the host community that they have to starve sometimes. On the particular um, analysis on single, uh, single female headed households, we found 50% of these vulnerable households had to experience food consumption reduction. They had to, the picture is almost similar in the host community. Availing loans is the most reported coping strategies. Only 2% can manage to save money. And this is because as they are have limited access to the employment and earning opportunities as they are women. So we can conclude that those who are involved in informal sector in these two communities were suffered most. Female headed household experienced the old scenario. So we can we can are recommending that focused skill development and training should be provided to female headed households. And targeted food and economic stipends is needed in both FDM and host communities to MPGs. Thank you all for listening to me and also thank you Ioni Wider for giving me the opportunity to present the important findings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saifa. Uh, next, we are going to uh, get a presentation from Kritika Singh, who is studying the varying compliance uh, with, with the COVID pandemic measures in India. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining me for this session. Today, I'm here to discuss my research work, which was understanding varying compliance with the COVID-19 measures within India. I used a mixed methods approach to identify and uh, examine the uh, positive outlier in the Indian provinces of Kerala, Maharashtra, and New Delhi. Hi, everyone. I am Pritika Singh. I recently graduated from the University of Birmingham. I'm deeply passionate about working in social development sector. I wish to be part of research and projects that work to enhance the state society relationship. Um, so the aim of my project was, my research was to understand why a country like India uh, could not elicit compliance. Moreover, the non-compliance arose to a level that it became the largest migrant crisis the country had witnessed since its independence in 1947. 
I also set out to understand why within the same country there were different areas that uh, uh, that could have um, that elicited different levels of um, compliance by the citizens. This was the methodology I used for my research. In the phase one, I studied the legitimacy of the country at center and in the within the provinces and what what degree of compliance they could have elicited at that point of time. So to understand that, I use a framework in which I analyzed the state society relationship, the quality of service delivery, perception of procedural justice and public trust. So I understood the legitimacy and the estimated compliance through these four segments. In the phase two, using a qualitative research methodology, I studied and identified the uh, the trends of non-compliance that were observed in Maharashtra and New Delhi. And in, in the last step, I compared these with the positive outlier that is uh, Kerala. So these were my findings. So firstly, a legitimate uh, state cannot fully uh, elicit compliance uh, so, for instance, in India, it is a highly legitimate state. The, the party is in power through popular votes, even in the surveys that were being circulated in the initial phases of the lockdown. It could be seen that the people are highly welcoming of the, um, uh, of the rules that are being set out by the government. However, soon, within a few weeks, the, the scenario completely changed and the largest migrant crisis surface. So this just goes on to show that uh, legitimacy cannot, can only partially elicit compliance by the citizens. Secondly, I understood that state legitimacy depends on the services and the perception of the procedural justice of the state. So uh, in one of the states that is New Delhi, while going through my data sets, I came across an interview in which one of the ladies was saying that uh, to be able to access these services that by the government, they have to be part of a certain circle, they have to be part of certain class. And if they're not, they will not get those services. And so this just goes on to show that even if the state, Delhi is a highly legitimate state, the people have selected that government time and again, and uh, they're highly approving of the leader. However, they did not, uh, since the access to the services were poor, they did not trust in the state and they did not comply with the rules that were being set down by the state. Thirdly, I came, uh, I understood that trust is the key factor that leads to uh, public action and citizens compliance with the state. And trust is not an absolute concept, it is fluid and needs to be instated time and again. Uh, going back to my example of Delhi, one of um, the major uh, non compliant sections of the society were the minority groups. And uh, so these minority groups, although had selected the same government, um, their experience with the government over the past few months had been rather harsh. So the same minority groups had been uh, subjected to a Citizenship Amendment Act and uh, subjected to the communal riots. So once they had these kind of experiences with the state, their um, trust had depleted, which kind of tarnished their relationship with the state and they did not comply with the rules that the state had installed. Um, so Kerala, the positive outlier, what, so they, uh, Kerala, what they did right was that they had a robust, a robust service delivery system. Their budget allocations has always been higher than any other state, even if their GDP is much lesser than those states. Um, then they had an agile response to the uh, emergency because of their, uh, because of their experiences with the previous epidemics. Most important and the greatest contrast I saw with the other states was the, the welfare and the degree to which they had provided services to the people. Uh, two examples I'd like to share here. One was uh, that the, while the helpline numbers were getting engaged in Delhi, Kerala offered help in nine different languages for its migrant workers. And even the kitchens, the community kitchens that were set up, they were offering food to the, cities, uh, to the migrants from their home, from their villages, so that they felt at home in Kerala away from their house. So um, this was how they, uh, Kerala was able to install and instill trust within the migrants and they were able to, um, you know, elicit high levels of compliance. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, this was all that I could present in these six minutes. If you have any other queries or questions, please do uh, look, uh, look through my document or you may also contact me. And if you have any constructive, constructive criticism, I'm also really looking forward to hearing from you about that. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Kritika, and, and, and thanks also for reminding us about the, the question and answer feature. There is a tab there. You can post your questions there and, and we'll address them uh, after the next presentation, uh, which is about uh, localized effects of the pandemic in Uzbekistan. And this is by William Seitz. Hi, everyone. My name is Will Seitz. Uh, it's great to be here with you today. Um, so I'm going to talk about dynamically identifying community level COVID-19 impact risks. Um, this was some work that we did in Uzbekistan with uh, co-authors who you can see the, you can see the names here. Um, but the, the, the situation uh, was, you know, early in the pandemic in Uzbekistan, pretty severe. Um, you know, society faced, a, faced an unprecedented shock. Um, but we knew that you know, not all needs were the same, that there were particular groups of people who were at elevated risk and who were in need of more support um, from, from, uh, from government and from other partners and NGOs. Um, there was uh, quite a bit of information that was available that was being collected at the local level in, this, in small uh, neighborhoods called Mahalans. Um, but that information wasn't systematically available to policymakers in, in a way that it could be acted upon. Um, and uh, at the same time, official surveys were uh, on, put on hold because of the risks of collecting. Um, so what we did was we uh, undertook an effort to consolidate all of this information, all this administrative data that was being collected at the local level um, at, in 9,120 neighborhoods. Um, and we matched it with a survey that was ongoing at the time called the Listening to Citizens of Uzbekistan survey, which was not disrupted by the pandemic because it was a, a phone-based panel survey. Um, and then we used uh, small area estimation techniques to fill in some of the gaps from the administrative data. So looking at uh, indicators or uh, measures that were not uh, directly observed um, and sort of imputing them at the local level using uh, small area estimation techniques. Then, uh, you know, with a combination of these different sources, we were able to create a database and a summary index of particular risk factors um, by these local communities. So for each of these 9,120 communities across the country. Um, and uh, we then, you know, together with our with our government partners, made this available to policymakers um, for the response effort. Um, so, as I said, in Uzbekistan, you know, early in the pandemic, the crisis was pretty severe um, due to lockdowns and and you know the risks um, that was posed to the, pub the public. Um, you know, employment uh, took a you know a sharp uh, downward trend uh, early in the pandemic. So a decline of more than 40 percentage points, uh, you know, in the number of households who had a member who was working. Uh, remittances are a really large uh, share of income for many low-income households in, uh, in Uzbekistan, and remittances fell by more than half early in the pandemic. Um, and the, the government was rolling out uh, mitigation efforts, you know, targeted social assistance and so on. Um, but, you know, resources were, were limited um, and uh, they wanted to make sure that they were targeting the, the resources to the people who were most in need uh, you know, from, from the impacts of the crisis. So here you can see graphically, you know, big uh, shocks to uh, in, you know, people working and uh, uh, in employment. So uh, basically there's, um, you know, these neighborhoods uh, in, in Uzbekistan collect uh, information about local conditions. Um, and this information was uh, typically uh, aggregated to the level of the rayon. So there's about 190 of those. Uh, and sometimes aggregated to the level of the region. So there's 14 of those. Um, but there wasn't a systematic way that this was all being collected and sort of given to uh, central uh, decision-making bodies on a, uh, on a very uh, regular basis. And so um, at the time of the outbreak, this information was not available to, to policymakers. So what we did was we collected all of that information, systematically cleaned it, made sure that it was all um, you know, uh, using consistent definitions and so on. And then we matched it with uh, uh, high frequency survey data that we had collected uh, using this uh, survey that I mentioned before. So on that basis, we did small area estimation for those indicators which weren't observed directly in the, at the local level. So here we're talking about um, you know, income, uh, remittances, these sorts of indicators um, using what's called the Fay Harriet area level approach. I don't have enough time to go through all the details, but we can discuss it if people have questions about that. Um, and then on that basis, uh, sort of using the Alkai Foster method, we created a, a, a community level risk index uh, looking at, um, you know, high uh, risk areas, trying to identify which places were in particular need of, of government support. Uh, during the so here's the, the index. It's uh, split across six dimensions. 
uh, with uh, indicators under each one. So the indicators within each uh, within each uh, dimension are equally weighted uh, at the beginning of the process, and then we reweight them based on feedback from uh, a stakeholder survey, um, and that uh, yields the final. Uh, Index. So this is the Mahala level index. So for all 9,120 Mahalas aggregated to the Rayon level, just above that, and you can see that there's some concentration of particular risk factors uh, across the country. Um, this also allowed us to look at uh, you know particular indicators that were of interest to the counterparts in a disaggregated way. So for instance, in March 2020, this was uh, you know at the Rayon level the uh, the number of households or the share of households where no household member was working in the past seven days. You can see there's a couple of, of clusters of that here. Um, moving to April, you can see that there was a huge decline in uh, reported employment, um, but that it wasn't. Uh, um, so that there were some, uh, again, uh, clusters of areas where it was particularly, um, you know, it was particularly strongly disrupted. And this happened in, especially in highly uh, populated dense areas. Uh, recovery uh, happened at different paces and different places. So you can see here by May, there was much of the country was back to work, but this was largely in areas that were rural agricultural areas um, and uh, urban areas remained under lockdown for a longer period. Uh, whereas by June, most places had relaxed, but again, there were some clusters of areas where the risk factors were higher and, and lockdowns were not in place. Um, you can see something very similar uh, for remittances. So this is remittance prevalence before the, the, uh, the outbreak. Uh, so in March 2020, you can see that there's some areas that rely much more on remittances than others. Um, moving to April, there was a sharp decline in, in remittances. Um, and it recovered, but in different places from where uh, people had typically been receiving remittances before. And so the composition of remittances changed uh, in the immediate aftermath of the crisis in May. Uh, and then in June, the, the, the full sort of spectrum of, of remittance uh, flows began sort of recovering uh, throughout the whole country, we can see here. So this information was uh, available. We made this available with our partners to, um, you know, to, to government and policymakers. Uh, you know, and, and so this was being updated uh, regularly on a on a dashboard, so that policymakers could uh, make decisions either on dimensions, on particular indicators, or the overall index uh, as needed. So thank you so much for this opportunity to tell you a bit about our work. I hope we uh, we get a chance to discuss um, questions and, and uh, maybe a little bit more detail, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thanks a lot. So it's time now for the Q&A session. So I would like to invite all our speakers to, to put their video on. And, uh, and uh, we already have a couple of uh, interesting questions here. Uh, so, let's start there's actually a question from one presenter to another so let's let's start with that so Kritika uh sci-fi is asking have you conducted any survey for this project uh you're you're muted I'm, muted. I'm so sorry okay. um i did this uh, research last year in uh, between may to june i'm sorry august so i was in uk doing my uh, masters um so it was locked down. I couldn't go back into India, although I had full plans to. So I used all the online data available. So that means interviews, tweets, um, or calls to my friends, families, their friends. Uh, however, I could get in contact over online, like phone or Skype or anything like that. I couldn't personally go for any surveys or anything like that. I, it was a desk-based dissertation. Thank you. Thank I hope you. that helps. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I understand. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Kritika, and, and good questions. Well, it kind of highlights the difficulties that everyone is having as researchers during this pandemic. Um, yeah. So there's a there's a question from to to William uh, from Atte who asks, uh, "I missed how the risk index was established. Could you ex uh, could you please explain how that is calculated?" Sure. Thank you so much for the the question. So, um, so so basically, it's a, a combination of uh, indicators from two different sources. Um, so the first source is the administrative data that was being collected by local communities throughout the country, um, and the second source was a, a a monthly panel survey that we had in the field before the crisis began, and it was active throughout the the, the crisis in in Uzbekistan, and it's still ongoing now. Okay. Um, so the the way that we um, 
um, we filled in sort of the information uh, for those indicators that weren't um, sort of universally available for all of the, uh, the these local communities was a, a technique called small area estimation. So we identified, you know, particular particularly important indicators uh, for for, their, um, for the crisis. So some of them were on food security, some of them were related to remittances, some of them were uh, related to income. And then we put the sort of the universe of all of the questions that we had available in a survey of to, that we sent out to, um, uh, to, to uh, various groups that were involved in the response effort. So it was including government, stakeholders and in international organizations, local NGOs, and they sort of responded about which indicators they thought were the most important to include in this risk index. So then we, we did the selection on the basis of this feedback, uh, and then the weights for them in the index were all using uh, the, the you know, the responses recorded in this sort of stakeholder survey. So the, the approach is just a basic Alkira Foster sort of um, like, you know, if you're familiar with an MPI uh, type of um, multidimensional poverty index kind of indicator, it uses the same approach, but the unit of analysis is the the, the, the local community instead of a, an individual or a household. So that was in a nutshell sort of how we how we did the risk index. Uh, thank you very much, Will. Um so I have a question for Saifa. Um, so I, I found your research very, very inspiring. So thanks a lot for presenting that to us. I was wondering how, the, if, if you've been following these communities for a long time and how these uh, recent events in, in Myanmar are affecting uh, the situation there in the refugee camps, if you have any, any follow-up uh, studies on that. Um, actually, it was a baseline study. We conducted this study in uh, from November to January. After that, the baseline study was stopped. But this is, a, as I mentioned in my presentation, that this is a large project. Um, this presentation is actually partial findings of a large project. Uh, so we have a plan to make a midline study, then the end line. So we guess we can. Uh, as you said that the Myanmar um, recent incidents, we can follow up these things in our midline, but not in this study. This is a very um, baseline study. Okay, thank you. We'll we'll stay tuned for those results as well. Thank you. Um, so there are there are questions from Rodrigo, Rodrigo Oliveira. So I was wondering if if he wants to ask them live. Seems to be that there is a, there is a lot of questions. So um and uh so i'm wondering if, if he can appear online or or i can also ask this uh in case he's not available okay so why don't why didn't i ask so there's a there's been a couple of questions uh and answers already between rodrigo and and, and uh, al muxid so just to repeat the last question that is that is there. So uh, Rodrigo is raising a concern that uh, perhaps the more vulnerable households have higher probability of receiving remittances, uh, but also stop working uh, at the same time. So how do you deal with this in your analysis? He's asking. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo, for this question. Um, I mean, we we here the to deal with this um, this question we in this paper we we use more we, we focus on remittances received um, before the, the, the pandemic happened and then uh, we make sure that um, when when the household stop working we make sure of the, the let's say the, the exogeneity between. Uh, past remittances and um, the likelihood to stop working because of the pandemic, because uh, the, the the underlying uh, assumption is that past remittances is not affected. There is no way to think that past remittances can be linked to to or the COVID nineteen can be um, can can be affected. Uh, remittances can be affected by the COVID nineteen. So this is how we basically our main. Uh, identification uh, strategy, uh, considering past remittances instead of uh, current remittances that may be correlated with the current pandemic. Yeah. 
Thanks. Uh, let me ask a follow-up question, a little bit related, but uh, I was wondering, in your view, you know, there are international and domestic remittances, right? So I'm, I'm guessing that the international remittances are larger, but maybe less frequent, whereas the domestic remittances are maybe more frequent, but less in terms of quantity. So how do you see which type of remittances have played a bigger role in, in this setup? Uh, so in this paper, I didn't have time to go deep uh, in the result, but we split off the remittances uh, according to the origin. So we find we do find that uh, international remittances have higher impact, mitigation impact than domestic remittances. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we have lost Kibram. I already had. I also had some questions for him, but let me let me return to to William. So I was wondering if you've been doing follow up work on this, and, and maybe the the time period you looked at this is quite a short term. So I'm wondering if if there's been a kind of bounce back to to the pre pandemic levels in terms of this incomes and, and employment and so forth. So if you've been doing any follow up work, it would be nice to hear about. It. Uh, yeah, so the survey that I was referring to is monthly and it's been going on, um, it, it started in 2018 and it's going up until now. So um, we sort of have a, uh, you know, a real time or near real time sort of uh, discussion of these results with our counterparts. Um, and, and basically, you know, what we found was that, um, you know, the bounce back was pretty quick. So it was just a couple of months before um, the, the labor market was sort of performing closer to where it was in the previous year, but that it took a very long time to get back to exactly the level that it had reached in 2019 at the same time. Um, and for some subgroups, it hasn't yet uh, fully recovered. So um, particularly among those who were self-employed uh, before, there was um, you know, a pretty quick bounce back among wage employees or formal workers and a much slower recovery for, for the self-employed. There are also some particular sectors that, that were much harder hit than others. So anything linked to tourism or, um, you, know, uh, you know, things like hotels, restaurants, these have had a, a much harder time sort of in the recovery than, um, than has been the case of, say, manufacturing or agriculture. So, um, yeah, there's some compositional effects, but largely speaking, you know, most of the, the recovery in the labor market has, uh, has occurred. At least it's gotten back to where it was in 2019. The remittances are a different story. So there, again, there's the question of sort of the composition of what um, what's happened. So, in the initial downturn, what happened was the um, the most of the migrants that we're referring to here are international migrants, and they're working in Russia, and the. The, the ruble uh, quickly lost value early in the pandemic. And so the value of remittances plummeted and people weren't sending back very many during that period of time. Um, but when the ruble strengthened sort of in May, June of 2020, uh, remittances started flowing again and then uh, recovered their level and, and went past it actually as a sort of a form of social protection, I think in the same spirit as, as some of the other uh, materials that have been presented today. So we, we found something very similar, but the challenge has been that no new migrants can go abroad, right? Um, so everybody who is abroad uh, can continue sending uh, remittances back. And even those who you know, had some of work disruptions while they were abroad continued to send you know, remittances back, maybe digging a bit deeper to help out family back home. But um, because of the lockdowns, the, the, sh the number of, mi of migrants going abroad is much lower than it was before. And this has had a large negative impact on uh, poverty reduction uh, since that time. So this is a, a big uh, headwind uh, in the recovery. Um, we have a, a bunch on food security uh, issues as well, but I've been talking a lot already. So uh, maybe we can get to that if somebody has particular questions. Okay, yeah, I think we are we're running out of time a little bit, but I see that Kibram is now back with us. So let's let me ask a question uh, for him uh, as well. Um, so your context is throughout Ethiopia, right? And uh, the PSNP operates, uh, has been operating there for a long time in these areas. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious about what do you think are the kind of channels for this uh, income shocks? You know, the, the World Bank and other organizations have been predicting that this pandemic is severely affecting urban areas, uh, maybe a little bit less the rural areas. So kind of what's your views about how the PSNP households are affected by is it through the agriculture channel or something else? Yeah, uh, th thanks. 
Thanks for the question, Kale. And sorry, I dropped earlier again, so I'm having issues with my connection. So yeah, uh, the pandemic can affect rural households in at least one of three ways, the way we see it. One is what we call the direct channel. That is because someone in the household contracts the virus and as a result, income drops, household income drops. And this in the rural context would mean hired labor. So households would make uh, incomes from uh, agriculture, agricultural income from hired labor would lose their incomes. And the second channel would be uh, the indirect channel, even if one does not contract the virus. The fear of contracting the virus alone would induce one to withdraw their labor supply from uh, the marketplace, and as a result, income drops. And, uh, and, uh, and related to this is the issue of restrictions, government restrictions. As a, uh, as a result of the range of restrictions that were put in place, uh, people cannot just access markets. So it, it, I have not discussed this uh, here, but in our data, we have a lot of qualitative questions where we ask households how they were affected. And roughly 25% of households say it's because of closure of markets, because of government restrictions. They cannot access the market. They cannot sell their products. And you see this in the variety of items people consume. So in rural areas, you see uh, the perishable, consumption of perishable goods going up. The reason is because people cannot access markets so the goods they would otherwise sell at in the in the marketplace they consume so it is just for the most part the channel is through this marketplace restrictions and uh, because of kind of withdrawn labor labor supply household income drops that's how we see this working and of course there is the uh so, so just briefly to touch, to touch on the value chains agricultural value chains so there is there was pretty much a collapse of it for a bit, but in the Ethiopian context, it was just reversed pretty quickly. So it bounced uh, very quickly, it didn't last too long. So those are the three channels we see. Thank you very much, Kitram. And uh, so we have basically one minute left. Uh, so uh, it's time for me to, to thank the presenters. Very exciting work. Uh, I'll be following up what you guys been, will be doing in this front in the future. And uh, thanks a lot for our audience as well. Uh, some of you have to wake up very early for this, uh, including the presenters. So um, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.